Hello, my name's Bernadette Russell. Welcome to How To Be Hopeful, my podcast all about hope, how to find it and how to keep hold of it once you've found it. This is episode 22 and this week I chat with 12-year-old climate activist Thierry Spall. I hope you enjoy our conversation. My name's Thierry Spall. I am 12 years old and I first got involved in climate campaign when I was eight. Yeah, brilliant. Great. Well, we'll, we'll get on to that because um, obviously that's a really interesting part of your story. Before we get into all that, I just wonder, Thierry, if there might have been anything, because this podcast is about hope, so I'm kind of trying to focus on hope and uh, in particular active hope and what we can do to make things better. If there's anything this week that made you feel hopeful um, I heard that in Sweden, uh, they are issuing public health warnings um, every time someone uses a petrol station, which is really good because it alerts them about the dangers and it makes them very aware of what they're doing um, by using petrol cars. And I think that's very good. Brilliant. OK, I'll check that out. Hopefully that will happen in other places as well. That's brilliant. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, as you know, I think we both chatted, I was thinking it was January when you and I had a talk, because you're um, one of the interviewees for my book, which is out very soon. I've got a copy for you right here with you in it. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I just wonder, before we get on to talking about your work as a campaigner, um, I just wondered how the lockdown had been for you in general. Well... I think it's all very confusing because no one's ever experienced this before. But in terms of the climate, no one going to work and um, no one flying anywhere. Um, The sky, um, I read something like the sky is 10% brighter or something. Now there's less pollution and planes cut down by 75% or something. Um, and it's just so great um, in terms of the climate, all the animals coming out. Um, you, you really get to see nature's come up to you a lot, I, I think, um, in, in terms of the climate, lockdowns affected it in quite a very positive way. And have you noticed a difference, Thierry, close to home? Did you notice, did you think the sky looked bluer? Did you notice more natural, more birds? Yeah. Or You did, that's uh, brilliant. We had a Jenny Wren make a nest in our attic. And Jenny Wrens have never come, like, uh, uh, up to us before. Like, as close as I got, like, maybe a couple of feet um, between the Jenny Wren. It wasn't scared, and we'd never had Jenny Wrens here before. And, yeah, that was a very big change. Have you? Did you miss school? Did you miss going into school? Um, I, I, I think... Um, I, I, I missed it in the way of, you know, socialising with people, but... At the same time, being able to work at a desk and look out over your garden um, it is quite relaxing. I mean, there's always being in a classroom, you can't really see much. You, you've just got to focus. But um, with, with homeschooling, you, you know, you haven't got a very tight schedule and you can relax a bit more. Do you feel like you learnt as much, Thierry, being at home and being homeschooled? Do you think... Do you think you learned as much, as far as you can say, do you think you learned as much as you would have done had you been in a classroom? Well, I certainly learned a, a lot, but I'm, I'm, I'm not... I say I, I would say I've learned as much, but not exactly as much as I would if I had been at school. Um, because you, you, you can ask questions more directly and get a direct response if you're, if you're at school. But I say I've learned the same amount, but about different things yeah and did you is a school sort of kept you busy and kept in touch how, how have they been keeping you what kinds of things have the school done to keep you um keep you occupied yeah um well that we have this app called show work where they submit um uh, online tasks for me to fill out and then submit back to them also online so they've been setting quite a lot of them but they've also been setting um fun competitions and a lot of them have been about 
making posters for the climate and um yeah i think that's been very good oh that's well, brilliant oh good oh, i'm glad to hear that and you, you mentioned that you were pleased to see and hear that the the sky's been bluer and that nature has a had a sort of chance to recover um yeah. in relating to that do you feel like there are any other things about lockdown or anything that happened because of covid that were good things or positive things and that you might like to keep hold of yeah um def- definitely because uh well when it was my brother's birthday we tried to buy him a bike but um we did manage it in the end but the bikes were all sold out and that that is that that is quite a special thing because everybody being locked down is making use of their one hour of exercise when it was still in place. They all went to the shop, bought bikes, um, and then they were out cycling around. Like, I've never seen so many cyclists sometimes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's really good. Cool. P- people, um, if they do have a garden uh, or a local park, that they're making a lot more use of that. And I think that's really good because they think, yeah, it's good to know what, what you're living around. Yeah. I it, I agree with you. I feel like a lot of people got to know their local area better, and maybe some people for the first time I felt were going into the woods or going, you know, going to, down to the um, down to the docks for the first time. Um, so I hope people keep that up. Do you? Because I think it helps people yes. to know. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and so obviously you and I first connected when when we were sort of talking about environmental things would you describe yourself as an environmental campaigner Thierry is that the right way yeah yes I yeah and um could you tell me I know it's a it's a while ago now proportionately to how long you've been alive and um, could you tell me how your interest in that very first began when I know you were quite a lot younger mm. yeah so it started out with animal cruelty. Uh, I was um, against animal cruelty. And at first I was against zoos. But um, uh, I figured out that most animal cruelty, I, re- I related it back to um, uh, pe- people poaching and that being a custom to people not really having enough money. But um, other than that, they, they have to poach. And um, birds dying from oil slicks and not just birds, sea life. And um, people not having enough money, um, so because their homes have been destroyed by a climate crisis, they have to go out and um, I don't know, hunt, poach. Uh, so yeah. you you were sort of seeing the way things were connected. I, I can, the climate, the climate crisis, and ecological crisis connected with poverty and racism. Actually, so, yeah. Mm. And where did you first access this information? What were you watching or listening to or reading? Oh well, I, I've I've got lots of books about nature at my house, mm-hmm. and we 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 often at least three times a week watch a nature documentary. So um, so was it was it did it start because there was a sort of family interest? Or would you say that it was led by you, or was it sort of something your whole family is interested in? Well, I mean, I kind of say it came out of nowhere. I mean, I I, I always did have a small passion. Just a small passion for like um, my surroundings and the insects um, around me, but then um, no, I, I, we we watch nature documentaries and we always used to like, wow, that's really amazing. But then only when climate change became more severe did the um, producers start talking more about climate change, and that's when that's what kind of raised my awareness. Yeah, and you said told me you were around eight. I think was that right when that first? Yes, um, when I was eight, I set up um. A group, and I tried to speak to my school about becoming more greener. And we, yeah, met every Wednesday at lunch. So you had like a lunchtime environmental group club thing, okay, which I know went really well. And d- you did something for your assembly, didn't you? You did a presentation, was that right? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. And were you? Did you say to me, Thierry, before that you felt quite um that you were quite influenced by David Attenborough? Is that? Yeah, right? definitely. Okay. I mean. And he uh, it was a very big influence. I mean, he showed me about um, all, all the animals and o- over the documentaries he made. Um, I, I, I love the way he lays everything out, and that, that's what inspired me to make my own documentary. Well, which we'll get on to in a moment, because I know you're working on that at the moment. So what, what could you tell me a little bit about how... So from that being concerned when you were around eight, at seeing what was going on, 
you became particularly interested in snow leopards, I think, didn't you? Because I remember you drawing me one a long time ago. So could you talk to me a little bit about that, how you particularly came to love snow leopards and what came of that love of snow leopards? I, I, I never heard of them. Uh, I, I was, I, I don't know, I, I, I looked a picture of one in a book and I was like, hold on, it says this is one of the big cats. I've never seen this before. And then I, ju- I just looked into the snow leopards. They were one of the most endangered big cats. There aren't many of them left, and that led to me adopting one and then later going to see one and hand-feeding one. And Yeah, it just escalated from there. They're so, I don't know, they're small, but they're quite vicious, actually. <laughs> and that, there's a charity that specifically uh, protects them, isn't there? That's yeah, Snow Leopard Trust. It's Snow Leopard Trust, yeah, and it's those that you connect to it. That's brilliant, okay. And from there, so you did these campaigns at schools and addressed assembly and did your snow leopard work. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you first got involved in Extinction Rebellion? Actually, how you first heard about that and how you first got involved? Yeah, well, um, by 2018, um, I was quite involved in a, um, a climate change. I'd made my own anti-climate change website. Um, and one day my mum said... Uh, she came up to me and told me that um, a new anti-climate change um, organisation has been formed called um, Extinction Rebellion. She took me to the website and I signed myself up as a member. Yeah, really? and, then and you were I about the... you were about ten then, right? Was that when you were about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say ten. Hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. And do you remember, or could you talk a little bit about the first action you went on, or the first time you went on a protest, yeah. or? So first we went on a school strike and um, uh, some of the teachers um, were quite against it and some of them uh, understood me perfectly. I I went with my friend Keir and another friend Otis who had been in my um, group since I was like eight. Um, So um, I I knew them very well. So I went out. um, It all felt like a very big deal. Like, Ooh, are we going to get punished for missing school? But, like, halfway through, everyone was, like, getting into the chance and we really got into it and we understood that everyone's doing this and um, it's really good. Did that make you feel, when you were there, Thierry, with all those other people, all for the same reason, did that make you kind of feel better? Do you know what I mean? Did, did, did you find that quite comforting? Yes, because um, I, I, I used to get upset quite a lot about, like, how no one actually seems to be noticing it. But when I actually got into the march, I noticed there are lots of people that um, that um, are fighting for the same reason. And I think, uh, yeah, it just looks like it. Yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? I always think, I think that feels like one of the really good reasons to join marches, because at least you're then, you're encouraged because, you know, as you said, lots of other people are doing it too. So I think that's a really good reason to engage with them, one of the really good reasons for that. Um, if someone was listening, like another young person was listening now to us, who wanted to help do whatever they might do um, to contribute towards um, helping the environment and helping to prevent cli- the climate crisis, um, what would you advise them to do if it was a young person, like a not adult person? Well, I, I'd advise them to take it up with um, their school teachers because that's that's the first big step. If they can get um, even the teachers to do one lesson on it, just enough to raise their fellow classmates' awareness, then in, if they get fellow friends that support the same cause, then they can go on a climate march together and that's that, that, that's really... It, 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 it will escalate from there and you'll build your love of climate marching and you'll understand why we do and you'll learn more about it. That's a really great idea. It's a really brilliant tip to speak to your teachers because you. I know you had quite a positive response from your teachers, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, m- most of my teachers. Yeah, so most of them, did they sort of present lessons as you asked them and support what yeah. you were doing for the most part? So I think that's a really good tip to anyone that might be listening that to speak to your teachers first and see what they might be able to, ooh, what they might be able to do about it. Um. When I was after I spoke to you back in January, I was reading a little bit about what uh, Greta Thunberg and various other uh, activists, Autumn Peltier, etc., had said. And one of the things she said was, "No one is too small to make a difference." And I just wondered if you if you agreed with that, if you agree that even if you're quite a young child, you can 
um, add your voice and that can have effect if you feel it, it can? Well, I, I, I semi-agree because I, I, I think that everyone needs to be informed, but I don't think, I, I don't know, say a six-year-old should, should be told this world is going through um, a sixth mass extinction because I, 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 don't, I don't think little children that have, have had nothing to do with climate change should, should have all that stress suddenly on their heads when, I mean, this generation didn't even cause climate change. Though I think that I was at a march once um, and uh, there was a child, a two-year-old, that went onto the stage and took up the mic and said, don't cut down trees. And I thought that was so sweet. <laughs> oh. I mean, a everyone's voice does count. Yeah. And I, I think that um, everyone's voice should be listened to and everyone's opinions justified and but I, I don't think we should bring down the full burden of of um everything onto people that um are still young and no really got any no it's a really interesting point i do worry about that as well because i think although i understand the call to tell the truth but like you i worry that for for, for really young kids or or anyone, it's going to be so frightening that it actually makes them feel like they can't do anything. So there's a bit of a balance there, isn't there? And that's, yeah. I think that's why for me, Thierry, I've been thinking about making people feel hopeful that what they do can make a difference. Because I think if people feel hopeful that what they do can make a difference, they'll do it. <laughs> and then there's more chance of this. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it definitely does. Yeah, so that's what I know you and I spoke about before. Um Thinking about, oh, I know what I wanted to talk to you about. Could you talk a little bit about, I know that you went on stage at the November extinction, was it in the November, October rebellion? October, around this time, yeah. Yeah, so could you talk a little bit about that and how that happened and what you said? And... Yeah, um, basically, I, I actually think it was around April because I think, yeah, it was two days after my birthday, which is in March, so... Um, I, I went. I'm, I was in Marble Arch Square, and um, uh, I was the only child that spoke up. And uh, I, I was. Ju I just turned eleven, so um, I, I, I thought, yeah, I, c I can do this. I, I'm, I'm eleven. So um, th they asked. Um, they, they sent out a series of questions say, and saying, what, what does, um, what, what do you think XR should do next in terms of should we keep this site? Should we, um, uh. Um, us to arm block it should we i don't know give um, a demonstration but allow people to come here still drive their cars and um i, I went up and said that um uh, that by now after a few days we should leave the site and make it a public um a, a public space for all to like plant um plant flowers here and trees and um i, I, I and organize a public organizing space to organize future Sorry, organize a lot. Um, uh, um, future events for XR, and um, yeah, I, I remember being very, very confused. Uh, I, I, I said, "Hello, my name is Thierry, and I'm 11 years old." And I was halfway through my word when the entire crowd started clapping, and I had no idea why. But yes, yeah, it was because um, uh, yeah, because I was so young. It's really powerful to hear, really powerful and important, as you said, to hear young voices and to have so many people listening to you. I think it's really powerful. It really brings that home to you as an adult. You're like, wow, we, there's a responsibility here, which is a good thing to realise that, I think. Um, and uh, so could you, I know the other thing you're doing at the moment is, and it sort of relates, winds back a bit to uh, our conversation about um, your being influenced by David Attenborough, you're making a documentary, is that right, at the moment? Yes, yes, I am. Um, about uh, nature you can find uh, very close to you without, like, having to go far. Um, I'm, I'm calling it Doorstep Nature, um, uh, a British guide. So uh, if you don't have a garden, or, um, then you, you can explore your local park. I'm, I'm going around to all the parks near me, and I'm having a closer look at... Um, uh, in, in insects and animal life in my garden and um and w when lockdown lifts um i i i, um, I travel to kent um for my mum's birthday uh but i also filmed a lot there um, about countryside nature 
And um, recently, I've, I've just come back from holiday. Yesterday, Shrewsbury, Derby, and Barnet. Um, I visited all set, all, all three sets of my grandparents. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there was loads of nature every, on on every step. And basically, uh, in, in Derby, I found an abandoned cow shed that had been abandoned in the 18th century. And it was like really old equipment there. And it was a bird of prey's nest. And um, I even found something. Uh, the bird of prey's nest was abandoned, which was slightly disappointing. But then I did find in, in the abandoned cow shed um, uh, on a nest, uh, um, a mother of two baby wood pigeons. Wow. Uh, I, I walked in filming. I was like, oh, "We've just found three empty nests and and uh, loads of old gardening equipment." I mean, some of it was interesting, but then then I turned around and I, I, and um, I, I nearly like I, I nearly screamed on camera. And the pigeon erupted in my face out of the corner of the nest, and um and and I was like, "Oh my god!" And it, it flew into my face, and and then out the and then out a window. I was like, "What what happened?" And I looked around, and there was a nest full of two shuddering baby pigeons. And I was like, what? "Yeah." Um. So so I filmed it, and then I I had to leave, so the mother didn't think like I'd kill its chicks or something. So but then the next day I checked on it, and it come back. So. So you've got some an amazing footage there. And what are you hoping to do with that, Thierry? Once you've put it all together. Well, I'm I'm gonna pick the best footage, and uh, 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 preferably some that don't involve me saying "bitch." Oh, oh my! Uh, and uh, my friend's mum uh, is um, a film editor, so um, I think she can help. Uh, she, she can help um, edit it. Well, um, she, she does lots of editing, so I think she can help edit it. And then um, I'm I'm gonna. Uh, offer it um, I'm, I'm gonna uh, show it to the BBC to see if I don't know they might publish it because uh, or or, um, or or anything really that's great I uh, mean I guess um, that would be wonderful if they took you up on it and hope they do but I guess you could put it on YouTube and just make yeah. ask lots of people to share it we I know we we'd be happy to share that and um, and I think does that some I think I spoke to you before as well I remember you saying to me before about how that was something you thought about doing. I mean, it's a long way off, but when you were growing up, you talked about perhaps doing something like that, like being a wildlife presenter, because that you felt that yeah. that was a really good way of communicating the message you want to communicate. Is that still something yeah. you're thinking about? Yeah, I mean, the um, the reason I was doing it is because um, I, I I wanted to like raise people's awareness about nature and their surroundings and my career as um, a zoologist and also a wildlife cameraman. Um, so I was thinking if, if I could just send it to, I don't know, someone like Chris Pack and maybe Brian Cox, um, I, it, it didn't become a reality, um, that I, um, the, the BBC might actually take it until I saw a documentary. It was about music that, um, a family had made in lockdown. And, um, I thought, wow, that, that's a family. They've been able to publish a documentary on BBC. It was really good. And I thought, well, they used their smartphones, tripods, and, um, they had a couple of good cameras. <laughs> I was like... Yeah, uh, let me try this. No, it does happen. Why not? You know, why not? And even if they don't take it, there are ways now that you can broadcast it yourself. So I think that's absolutely brilliant. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. And I'll make sure that everyone who listens to this podcast, when you've done it, knows where it is. <laughs> um, so um, just sort of moving ahead to thinking about um, the future, I w- I've been thinking, Thierry, about how it's useful in a way for us to try and think about the future in sort of what we want, not not what we don't want, but what we want, so that we can kind of work towards it. And if you could have, like, magic wand, the kind of future that you would like to see by the time you're grown up, what kind of world would you like to see when you're grown up? What changes do you want to see happen? What, what sort of world do you want to grow up into? If you could have it exactly as you wanted. Um, well... I'd like to see a world where um, nature um, and humans are alongside each other. Like um, I, I, I said to um, a, a, a learning mentor when she asked me, what would you like the world to be? And I said, I, I'd like, um, this is when I was eight, I said, um, I'd like uh, nature and, and, and uh, humans um, to be treated as equals. And she said, and, and, and she looked like, really? And... Um, 
And I was like, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? It's a, it's a radical proposal, but I'm with you there. Why not? You can think in a, a, not in an anthropocentric way and think about everything being a person. It's an interesting way of thinking, isn't it? Uh, some people will say, um, uh, some religious people will say we've got, we've got to respect God um, because God is our creator. And um, I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, to some people, God is mother nature. And if we respect our creator, then I think it's perfectly, um, we need to respect mother nature um, because uh, she created this planet, the universe. Well, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's lovely. And if you... Because obviously, I think it's difficult for children, not just for children, but for other people who might, for whatever reason, not feel like that they've got any power. But as a child, what, what, what would you like to say to the adults that are listening who do perhaps have more power, perhaps, than you, who perhaps have more agency, who perhaps can affect changes that you might not feel you're able to? What do we need to be doing that we're not doing? <laughs> well, I think that... Um, we we should listen more to nature and f- feel what we need. Like, um, if a nuclear power station is opened and then the skies around it go black for at least a mile, then I don't think we should go. Well, let's try and uh, build a fan to blow the smog away. Um, we we should listen. Well, may- maybe this nuclear power station isn't doing the right thing. Then um. Um, I, I, I just listen more to our environment, to, to what we're doing, and see if what we're doing has a drastic effect or a positive impact. Yeah, that's good. Um, it's just sort of paying attention, isn't it? Paying attention to what affects what our actions take, I think. So that's brilliant. Um, and if anyone that was listening wanted to support any of the charities you support or wanted to get involved with anything you're involved in, or make donations, Thierry, is there anywhere that you'd like to suggest people made donations or got involved? Or Well, the, the, there's, lot, there's lots of places. First of all, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very good friends with the Big Cat Sanctuary, and that, that's a really nice organisation. They're, they're all really nice there. Um, it's, a, it's a private sanctuary, but um, if you want to donate, you can go to their website, and um, I, I went to the Big Cat Sanctuary when my group did a fundraiser for it. We raised um, like £200 um, by selling uh, um, animal um, like T-shirts and merchandise. I, I, it was very nice. Um, but it, the Extinction Rebellion website provides you with um, plenty of different places to donate to, like um, to people uh, postering the streets, um, to, to the people trying to take action um, in courts to try and threats persuade the government with people striking and there's always um other organizations like wwf and snow leopard trust they're really really good um if, if you want to donate to um help animals then greenpeace or wwf is good yeah there are yeah. loads of amazing organizations aren't there that's brilliant thank you and i think i'm gonna see you on the first of september which is yes. part of this autumn's rebellion so what I think I might do, Thierry, is I might bring my Zoom, my microphone, and we can record a bit on that day maybe of what's going on and the noise mm. and the chanting and all the fantastic things that are going on and have a little bit more chat about what's going on there. What do you think? We can report, yeah, from, we can report from the field. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And um, can I just have a look at your T-shirt, even though it's very nice. He's wearing an Extinction Rebellion T-shirt. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. I'm really proud to know you and um, it's been really nice to talk to you. And thanks for all your brilliant work. And um, also, I'm really looking forward to seeing the documentary. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll see you on Tuesday, 1st of September, yeah. and we'll do some more. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So Thierry and I had made our plans. We, we were going to meet at Parliament Square on the 1st of September 2020. I was going to interview him and his mum about the experience of being there, about him delivering his letter to Parliament 
and about what else was happening that day. It was the beginning of the Extinction Rebellion, October Rebellion. I was really excited. Now, I've been on a lot of marches and protests. Years and years and years and years and years of them. Too many to remember. I've done a lot of marching. And I'm going to be completely honest and say I've never found them a particularly easy place to be. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, I'm a bit of an introvert. I always feel really exhausted after I've been at them. But I still think it's a really brilliant and important thing to do. Sometimes it's just really important, I think, to turn up and show up and stand up and be counted. And as Thierry said, it's also really nice to feel yourself in the company of lots of other people who care about the same thing. It can really boost your hope and give you a lot of hope to know that you are one of many. To remind yourself of that just because you're in the thick of a crowd. And this crowd, as I got there to Parliament Square on the 1st, was really, really lively. Clock was round the square. Clock was round the square. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to join this other march. We're all going to go clockwise round the square. We're leaving. We're going to join this group here. We're leaving from this corner over here, everybody. So get your banners, get yourselves ready. We're going out this way. Clockwise round the square. Get behind it. Get your stuff ready, everyone. Take care. One of the really important things that happened that day was the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill, easy for me to say. A private member's bill had been tabled by Caroline Lucas, the Green Party MP. Um, as far as I understand it, a bill being tabled is literally it being put on the table in both chambers of the Houses of Parliament for consideration. And I'm just going to read to you what the Climate and, Emer and Ecological Emergency Bill Alliance was all about from their website. So on the 12th of August, we launched the campaign for the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. This is a private member's bill and taking it through Parliament will be a hard fought process, but it's been done before with major climate legislation. This is an alliance bill that's been written by scientists, lawyers and activists. It's gathering support from a broad range of campaign groups, businesses, charities and individuals. The bill has the potential to become the most significant move forward since the Climate Change Act 2008. I think this is really important and there's a lot of hope in that statement. One, there's a lot of hope in the fact that an MP tabled this really important bill that a lot of children and young people in particular care about. Secondly, there's a lot of hope in the fact that it was written by an alliance of people from all different backgrounds. As it said, scientists, lawyers and activists. I think that's really important. And the fact that it's even being considered was really important. So I was very, very pleased to hear that hashtag... Back the Bill was being supported that day. Another really important thing that was happening that day is the children of XR were delivering their letters to the British government in which they outlined their hopes for the future. And Thierry, of course, had written his own letter, which he'll shortly be reading out and sharing with us. To all members of the British government, including the Prime Minister, I'm writing with and for the argument of millions of people all over our planet, but most importantly, the people of this country, where your decision will matter. Quite frankly, I'm not even sure if you're aware that we're entering a sixth mass extinction, and soon there will be no turning back. I'm sure by now that you've heard the phrase, the sixth mass extinction, thrown around quite a lot by now. And no one is entirely sure what it means? Well, you better start listening, because... Honestly, most of the government, and I mean about 80%, is more concerned about the threat of a war, which may never happen, when climate change is already happening. Over 100 species go extinct every day, and more than 1 million species are at risk of extinction by climate change. And don't think, poor animals, oh well, what can you do? Let's continue building HS2. Because don't think that we won't be next. We will. Well, I suppose the climate change facts are one thing, but they won't swear a determined business person. So let's see. The government is getting protests from people saying that they don't want immigrants in the country. And I even found this racist and vicious statement from the Tory party, trying to force a petition onto the rest of the government only two years ago. It said, the UK government need to prevent immigrants from entering the UK immediately. We must close all borders and prevent more immigrants from entering Britain. Foreign citizens are taking all of our benefits, costing the government m millions. Many of them are even trying to change the UK into a Muslim country. Can you believe that? 
and this is connected to climate change. Some immigrants flee because of a war in Syria or in other countries where it's this government funding and selling weapons they need to attack them. And the reason people are attacking the Middle East is for oil, which is a fossil fuel, and which could run out in the next 40 years if we speed up our consumption rates, which we are. And some immigrants are fleeing because of the global warming melting the ice caps and sending massive floods cascading into their towns and cities, making them flee into so-called Great Britain. But if we switch to clean energy, not overnight or anything, but if we gradually built up a carbon-neutral country, immigrants wouldn't have to come into this country because the planet wouldn't be suffering so drastically. And believe it or not, there would be less wars by then because... At that point, we'd be a successful, sustainable, wealthy economy, despite the original cost. Because if we persevered this time and actually got it done, then other countries might follow our examples and switch CO2 neutral, just like we are with Sweden and the health warnings on petrol pumps, hopefully. Then, as you probably guessed, the other nations would stop or decrease mining oil in other countries, which would almost certainly stop a certain oil fueled war that no one has managed to stop so far, worth a try. Though I'm not saying it would eliminate all wars indefinitely, only fuel consumption based ones. But even wouldn't that alone make it worthwhile? I'm insisting that you listen to the citizens that are loyal to you, whilst they still are. Yours, in hope. Thierry Spock. Extinction Rebellion had plans to march together with We Want to Live banners. A sit-in was planned at Parliament Square, with assembly happening on the 1st of September. And the instructions were to bring to Parliament Square noise, colour, flags, masks, hand sanitizer, art, but also to bring love, to bring hope and to bring a friend. And all of that was present in full effect and it was absolutely fantastic. two really fantastic young activists in Parliament Square. I also interviewed Thierry and his mum about how they felt about being there and their reaction. Mm, and here's the bad news. Now this is the first time in years of recording podcasts and doing field recordings this has ever happened. I don't know exactly what happened but mysteriously all I was left with was recordings of amazing samba bands and none of the interviews. So at a later date I really hoped to get in touch with the young people I spoke to who spoke brilliantly and eloquently and really hopefully about why they were there and what they did. But in the meantime, if you'd like to get involved with Extinction Rebellion, find out more about the October Rebellion, you can find them here, extinctionrebellion.uk, and then you'll find out about all the other actions that are going on and every other way you can get involved. It isn't always about marching and those kind of actions and protests. There's lots of other ways you can get involved. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a really great week. My book launch is happening this Thursday. Hope to see some of you there. I'm super excited and it seems beautifully um, serendipitous to be launching a book about hope in the same week that the young people and children and elders and grandparents and teachers and all kinds of different people are assembling all over the country uh, to hope and work together and to protest and to make art to imagine a brighter future. Thanks for listening. Bye.